Hi guys, after my top 5 best switches and top 10 worst switches videos, I'm back with another Top X video. And today we're going to take a look at the top 9 weirdest mechanical keyboard switches ever made. Weirdest is a bit subjective of course, and there are several ways in which a switch can be weird, but in this video I'll be concentrating mainly on the weirdness of the operating mechanism of these switches, either because it's ridiculously overcomplicated or redundant or just very different from everything else. Some are good, some are bad, but all of them make you think, what the fuck? Kicking off at number 9 we have Fujitsu Peerless, a somewhat unpopular switch that replaced Fujitsu's excellent leaf spring switches. It's a dome with slider design at heart, but they went about it in a really convoluted way in order to get something vaguely resembling a clicky noise out of it, and it has a key feel that I'd describe as stiffer and crappier buckling springs. I explained how they work in my dome with slider mega review video. The switches are essentially a slider with a spring in a sock, in a barrel plate, over domes, over a membrane. It makes use of a curved assembly, including a metal back plate, which in this case is held to the barrel plate by a million billion little screws, and all this seems like it would kind of counteract the cost-saving measure of going with a rubber dome system anyway. And that's not counting that going for rubber domes and what you want to become a clicky switch isn't very intuitive either, especially because the clicky noise is very soft. Seriously guys, what's the point? Couldn't you have just stuck with your amazing leaf spring switches instead? Next up, at number 8, we have Futaba MD switches, also known as Futaba Complicated Linear. This switch was patented in 1982, which might sound excessively old, but that's basically around the time all the major switch designs we know were brought out, such as Cherry MX, Alps SKCL SKCM, Buckling Springs, NMB High Tech Space Invaders, etc. etc. This wave of redesigns was done to make switches that were less tall, and some manufacturers took the opportunity to also make the switches cheaper and simpler to make. For example, in going from beam springs to buckling springs, the height was drastically reduced and the parts count was lowered from 8 to basically just 2. But Futaba MD is an exception to this rule. It consists of as much as 16 parts, which is an absolutely insane number, especially as it's just a linear switch, so it doesn't even need a clicker or a tactile part in it. We have the top shell, shell base, two legs, coil spring, leaf spring, contact pan, two contact leaves, a separator membrane, rubber insulator, plastic seal, main slider, side slider, o-ring, and a rubber dampener. Compare that to Linear Alps at 10 parts, Cherry MX Black at 6, Linear Space Invaders at 5, and Buckling Springs at, well, 2, and you can see that a 16 part switch might have been slightly over the top. Worse, the key feel isn't even very good. Then, at number 7, we have Tesla MS1 SS1 Quad Magnet Hall Effect Switches. These were a redesigned knockoff of MicroSwitch SW series, which use magnets to create a hole voltage which can be measured to create an excessively reliable switch. Both designs clip into a metal frame. Tesla went rather over the top by using no fewer than four magnets per switch with these, and they marked the polarity of the magnets as well using some white paint. Curiously, the magnets alternate from top to bottom, and although I don't have an oscilloscope to measure it, I guess you would get quite an interesting output pattern, possibly a very sharp one. As I mentioned in last week's Electronica keyboard review, the Soviet Union had a habit of rather over-engineering their equipment, and this is a great example because Jesus biscuit baking Christ, why the hell would you need four magnets for one single switch? Next on our list at number 6 is Alps Integrated Dome, which actually made the number 10 spot on my worst ever keyboard switches list as well. This is one of those cases where I just have no idea what the hell was going through their minds when they were designing it. It's actually a discrete soldered in switch which has two two pin contact pads embedded in it, which are bridged by a rubber dome with a conductive carbon pad at the bottom, and on top of that sits the slider. Now, one of the advantages of using discrete switches is that you're not limited to the key field that rubber domes bring, but inexplicably, they decided to stick a rubber dome in it anyway. 
Now, you might think that perhaps this design could bring out the best of both, but in actuality, it's the exact opposite. Believe it or not, the key feel is worse than a standard rubber dome keyboard, as for some reason, there is very little tactility in these domes, and yet, at the same time, the key feels rather mushy and hideously short travel as well, so you end up with a really roundabout design that manages to be worse than a random crappy rubber dome keyboard. At number 5, we have a switch that's weird not because it's overcomplicated, but rather because it's undercomplicated, and which bear the already rather intriguing name of Oki Tactile Gold Spring. The name is a misnomer, the switches are actually clicky. And, unbelievably, they're basically single-part switches. The entire switch is just this really weird-looking spring thing sitting on top of a set of membranes. It works by having this enlarged coil slip past a narrowing in the slider well, which fires the spring down after building up enough tension, causing the tactile feel, clicky sound, and a perfectly synchronized actuation of the switch. It's a very admirable design, and it feels pretty good even, and the fact that they managed to get the tactility, clicky noise, return force, and actuation, all with just a single part, makes this a super elegant design in my opinion, even if it's rather wacky. Next up, at number 4, we have a switch that you hear very little about, but which is quite well respected by those that know it, Mark Ward Butterfly. The switch is thusly named because of this centerpiece, which is an extremely curious looking crumpled up partially disconnected two flap leaf spring that vaguely resembles a butterfly. Unfortunately for the butterfly, in the switch it's actually impaled on a spike in the middle, as if it were designed by a fucked up lepidopterist, and the two flaps partially immobilize the leaf in such a way that both parts point up, although at different angles, resembling a wonky seesaw or something. Then, one of the flaps hooks into the slider, and when you press it, it kind of does a butterfly wing beat, with the slider part going down, and then the other end flipping down from under a hollowed out part in the slider onto a set of contacts, which closes the switch. When you have the switch open, sometimes a seesaw can flip too far in the wrong direction, or the leaf won't get back into the slider, which can make this thing kind of a bugger to reassemble if you forgot what it looked like originally. The key feels actually really quite nice, but the question remains, who went ahead and said, hey guys, I've got it, let's build a two finger mount skewered double flapping leaf spring thing switch. There's even a double action version of it, which has another separate clicker that creates a second click and bridges a different contact if you press it down all the way. I mean, jeez. Next up, we have an extremely old switch, the mousetrap switch, of which I have a cherry version here, which is from 1959. The cherry version hasn't been spotted in a keyboard yet, but other mousetraps have been documented in one or two keyboards. They all look very similar and work according to the same principle. The idea is that the handle assembly forms one contact terminal, and this little blocker post here forms the other, with a pivoting leaf spring alternating between open and closed. The leaf spring is tensed against the handle post using a coil spring hooked into it, and when the handle is pressed down, the upwards tension eventually flips the leaf spring onto the blocker post, closing the switch. Both parts are even outfitted with crosspoint contacts, just like Cherry MX. The slider just sits in a top plate and pushes on the handle, much like a mechanical finger. It's a very cool system, and it results in one of the most weakly tactile and addicting to use switches out there, particularly because it sits very comfortably in your hand, almost as if it was made as a toy for annoying your co-workers with. Getting close to the end, at number 2 we have ITW Magnetic Valve. The video I explained the system in took me weeks to make as the electrical workings of the switch are just mind-bogglingly complicated. The explanation of that video took almost 5 minutes and several dozen diagram drawings. In short, it involves AC simulating pulsed current induction through two wire loops inductively coupled via a bead, filled with magnetizable filings which can be opened, or rather closed, via a magnet embedded in the slider which locks the magnetization in the ferrite bead. 
To provide N-key rollover protection, it uses a patented system of multiplexers, which scans each key in turn for presses by grounding it through one multiplexer and disconnecting it through the other, leading to an asymmetric charge buildup across the valve output line, which the controller detects and stores in its memory until it's no longer found to be pressed. This switch came out in a time in which Hall Effect and capacitive switches, which are both also very robust yet significantly less complicated designs, were already on the market, and while I find their incredible convolutedness to be highly entertaining, I really wonder whose contorted mind came up with this stuff. They even remained in production until 2005 too. Finally, at number one, we have a switch that's so weird I still don't know completely how it works, and of which I don't even understand the whole point either. It's the Tokai MM9 switch and its associated clones. The switch consists of two two-pointed terminals embedded in the shell base, on top of which sits an alloy metal ball bearing, and on top of that sits a coil spring and then the slider. After a very long time, I finally managed to work out how it roughly should work, but I still don't understand the details. The weirdness, and what I really didn't understand at first, is how pushing the metal ball further down on the contacts is supposed to close the switch, as the ball rests on top of both terminals already. And yes, I tested it, and if it just lies on top like this, the terminals are connected. But I tested them, and yes, the switches actually work. Now I managed to find Tokai's original patent on these switches, and although it's all in Japanese, the drawings seem to suggest that some not readily identifiable part in the slider holds the ball off of one of the contacts until you push it down. I suppose that this unidentifiable part is this little lip in the slider, and I guess I know what the idea is now, but I've had difficulties actually replicating this effect using the switch parts, as it seems the lifting needs more of a horizontal motion than a vertical motion, but whatever. Anyway, what's even worse is that I have two switches from different clone manufacturers with internally almost completely identical parts, yet one is linear and the other is tactile. Now this is where the what the hell alarm truly starts to glow red hot. Seriously, what's going on here? These little bastards just have me completely stumped. I have no idea how in God's green ass crack this thing works. I've gone over it time and time again, but everything I can think of just doesn't seem to actually be happening. Even worse, the lifetime of these switches is apparently only 2 million keystrokes, which is very low, only 1 25th that of modern Cherry MX switches, making them rather useless on top of being incomprehensible. Uh, um, what the hell, Japan? So that's it for this Top X video. Thank you for watching, I hope you enjoyed it, and feel free to suggest something if you want another Top X video. Anyway, see you next time, guys.